Okay, okay. everybody, welcome uh, to the third Thursday's Inventors Gathering. Um, today we have a guest speaker who it was um, a colleague of mine. We've been working on a project which we're just finishing up. His name is Benedetto Skirde. Um, he is, I think, a senior now at Rutgers University studying electrical engineering, and he's very interested in environmental issues. And he and I started working together, uh, I think it was about nine months ago. And I'm afraid I asked him to do some things that I didn't know enough about. And so uh, in some ways, we wasted some time, but we learned a great deal. And he's going to present that work today. One of the things that we think is important, one of our mottos at Public Convention is that we work in the light. And that means that we show people our work while we're doing it. And we show it even when it's not particularly successful um, in hopes that someone else will learn from our mistakes and be able to carry the work uh, forward. So that's what you're going to see today. Um, I've invited the uh, the small audience of four or five people here that we have to interrupt Benet as he's giving his talk if they have any questions. Um, so Benet, let me turn it over to you and you can correct me if I've got your introduction incorrect. Awesome. So mostly, mostly correct. My name is Benny Skirty. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Rob the last couple months on this project. Um, I am a junior at, at in electrical engineering at Rutgers, um, but for the most part, everything else that Rob said was very on point. Um, so yeah, I'll just get right into it. So impedance sensing implants a failed approach. So when we started this project, we had a pretty lofty goal. Um, we expected, you know, in a couple months that we would have a full embedded system set and ready to go where we would be able to essentially take data from a plant, um, electrical data to particularly impedance and read that in a way where we would be able to describe the health of the plant. Um, when we started this, you know, I'm not a botany expert. Uh, Rob is also not a botany expert. Lawrence, who just joined and also worked on the project with us, also not a botany expert. So we had a lot of uh, groundwork to cover for sure. What we did find just the very on a very basic level, the main points that we found in our literary research was started with impedance sensing is easy. And depending on the tools you use, it can be cheap as well. So it's a great tool for hobbyists or organizations that don't have a lot of funds to do experimentation or, you know, for our application, work with plants. The thing was, so what we found that impedance sensing would give us in terms of information is that impedance of wood um, or other types of plants with high moisture content is very, is low and vice versa. So higher impedance means lower moisture and the other way around. Um, also, we found that as tree health improves or plants become more vascular in like their stems, um, impedance will decrease. And electrical impedance spectroscopy uh, or EIS is an effective tool to measure moisture content in plants. Um, so we wanted to see if we could do this with lower cost materials on and also make it open source um, so that we could share this with um, public inventions audience. So the main tool that helped us out with this experimentation is called the Nano VNA. Um, and VNA stands for Vector Network Analyzer. What a Vector Network Analyzer is, is it's a, it's a device used to find the frequency response of a, an electrical tool or device or network. So it'll find the magnitude and the phase of a voltage response of a system based on a signal input. And it allows um, a user or an experimenter to characterize the frequency response of a frequency dependent device, um, especially for, it's especially important for RF applications or radio frequency applications. So what then, the problem with a traditional vector network analyzer is typically they cost several thousands of dollars. So, unless you're working for a research in research institution that has access to those kinds of funds, typically you won't get to work with one. But the nano VNA, which is an open source device that 
I guess went on the market uh, two or three years ago, roughly, is a handheld vector network analyzer that can take measurements from 50 kilohertz to two gigahertz. So mainly in the radio frequency range. And it costs to buy online about $200. So it's a really cool piece of technology that gives uh, people who don't have necessarily thousands of dollars to spend on an experiment the opportunity to record the same data that research, institu research institutions do in their experiments. So because of this, this is a super attractive option for us to use for our project. So the fundamental hypothesis that we wanted to work with was that we wanted to show that we could take a plant and show that stem impedance would decrease with improved health of the plant and in particular, in increased moisture content of the plant. So our idea was that if we would, we set up the experiment so that we would have had two plants. And the main idea was if we don't water one plant and we continue to water one plant regularly, the watered plant would have a lower impedance, relative impedance compared to the dry plant. Um, and this had been shown in our in literary research in a lot of the papers that we read, but the main difference is that we were trying to do this with low cost materials in a way that we could show that we could make we could take this research and make a device that would be accessible to anyone that wanted to pursue botany or make a garden or use this for any kind of hobby or a low cost low cost um, venture. Unfortunately, our results were inconclusive, but we were able to lay up down a lot of important groundwork for this project to be picked up in the future. So description of the apparatus, uh, we have a picture here of one of the plants on the right. So our setup that we used was very similar to the setup in an experiment of a paper we read. In this paper, which was from a group of scientists from the Russian Academy of Sciences, basically what they did was they took the stump of one plant, like the connected root system that and the connect that connected into the bottom of the trunk, and grafted it with the top of another plant. These were trees, so they were wood plants, not um like what we see here. This is a smaller scale. But basically they grafted these two parts of the plant together and they measured the impedance across the wound. And as the plant healed over time, they were able to show that impedance decreased as the vascularity of the trunk increased. So we wanted to do that on a similar level, but focusing mostly on moisture content. So what we have here is, I'll try to explain just looking at the picture. So you'll see at the top of the plant we have uh, one electrode and then one electrode towards the bottom, roughly about two to two and a half centimeters apart. In between these helical electrodes, which were made out of nickel and the plant stem are cotton pads, which we soaked in 5% calcium chloride solution. So that we, the idea, the idea was for this was, again, we got this from the paper that we had read. They did something similar in order to make sure that the electrodes were connected well and conducted well with the stem of the plant. And then this piece over here, which is coming out of the electrodes is a coaxial cable, which I essentially untwisted the top end and soldered one part of the cable to one electrode and one part to the other. This way we could get, a, we could use the nano VNA to send in a signal and get a frequency response measurement across these two electrodes. So just to go over the description of our experiment um, briefly, and then I'll get more into showing data. A lot of what we did and the methods that we used to take measurements changed over the course of the experiment because we went in, not that we didn't do enough preparation. We, I felt like we prepared adequately, but as we started to experiment, we started to learn more about what was successful and what kind of changes we needed to make to get better data. So anyway, going over the timeline of the experiment a little bit. So we started with, like I said, we had two plants, um, each with the same setup that we saw on the previous slide. We left one plant unwatered and continued to water one plant as needed over a 10 day span. 
and we took down the measurements at five different frequencies of their um, voltage magnitude response or their transfer function response, which would is related to the relative impedance of the plants. Um, and I'll explain more once we show the uh, graphs that we took because it'll be easier for me to explain that way. So at, over, after this first 10 days, we didn't see much of a change. So we left both plants unwatered rough, for roughly 10 days. Um, I would like to say there was a reason behind this, but honestly, it was just because I went on vacation um, and the plants were at home, so I didn't get to water them. But it was kind of a blessing in disguise because when I came back, um, just for um, just out of curiosity, I measured the impedance across the plants, which now were both much drier than I had left them before I had gone on vacation. And I saw a huge jump in relative impedance. Um, so what me and Rob discussed was we decided, OK, you know, we've now seen that we left these plants alone for an extended period of time and there's a huge impedance jump, we should, you know, continue experimenting further. So what we did was we took the plant that we were not watering originally and we rewatered it over roughly two weeks. And we just, and we monitored the changes uh, again in the relative impedance over the same frequency range to try and see if it would improve or decrease the impedance and thus improve the plant health, excuse me, plant health overall. And then for another five days, um, we wanted to measure the impedance before and after soaking the pads in the solution to see what effect that impact that had. And I'll explain more why we did that later. So starting with the first third of our experiment, that first 10 days where we were comparing a dry plant with a wet plant, um, we found that the dry plant had higher overall impedance. And I'll start referencing these graphs on the right side now, just to try to explain a little bit. So when you're looking at what we're seeing in this graph is essentially the decibel relationship of the output voltage compared to the input voltage that was put into the nano VNA. So as you get lower and lower on this decibel scale, it means that there's higher impedance because the output is the output of the um, of the device of the device of the electrodes and the measurement we were taking is lower than the input. So we're, we were comparing on a relative basis as opposed to taking um, direct impedance measurements. So like I said, the we did see that the dry plant had the higher overall impedance than as opposed to the water plant, but the changes were not really conclusive. We did find that we saw a greater variation at higher frequency ranges, which is why you can see we changed um, over the course of the experiment so that we were taking measurements at higher frequencies. Um, here, the yellow one is like five megahertz, the blue one is 10 megahertz, and then up here is within the range from 50 kilohertz to one megahertz, um, which is what we were taking from originally. So we saw a higher variation in changes at the higher frequency ranges, but essentially these results weren't really something we could work off of because they were just too similar. And over the course of time, on top of that, just looking at the plants from a qualitative perspective, no, neither plant suffered any visible damage. Um, we had picked plants, unfortunately, that were not very sensitive to water loss, which was not something that we had researched beforehand. Um, so because of this, leaving it unwatered, leaving a plant unwatered for 10 days didn't really have too much of an impact. Uh, so it, the results were very similar. Moving on onto the rewatering experiment. You could see, so I took measurements um, a little bit more consistently over this part of the experiment and a little bit closer in timeline, as opposed to taking measurements once a day, I was taking them I want to say twice a day. I want to say I was doing the best I could to get measurements 12 hours apart. So initially we saw a quick drop in the conductivity. As you can see here in this blue line, it's easiest to tell. Um, we started right up near negative 1.5 decibels, probably around negative 1.6, and immediately dropped to almost negative 2 decibels, which corresponds with an uh, increase in impedance. 
which was not what we expected. Um, but over time, we did see a gradual increase in the conductivity um, or a decrease in the impedance, which is what we expected. So these results were a little bit more promising than the previous phase of our experiment. Then in the last piece, like I said before, we compared how our measurements were before and after wetting the um, cotton pads between the electrode and the stem with our calcium chloride solution. The reason we did this is because originally when I was taking measurements, I was um, soaking the pads before every measurement. And then I switched, I wanna say during the second phase, I switched to see if it would cause any difference. Um, and because of that, we, I, well, I wasn't really able to tell if there was any difference or not between soaking or not soaking. And obviously I had changed throughout the course of the experiment. So to validate our results in the second phase, I wanted to make sure that it wouldn't cause a change if we had soaked the pads beforehand, as opposed to if we didn't. Unfortunately, it did cause a change. So that kind of, um, uh, for a lack of better terms, poo pooed on our uh, the previous phase of the experiment. Our results uh, they weren't as reliable because of this. So you can see, especially on this first day, after we wet the um, pads, we dropped from about negative one point five decibels almost down to negative two decibels, which is a huge jump in um in the relative impedance. So. Essentially, what we found from this is that in the future, we would need to do a lot more research to figure out how to control this variable and what's going to give us the most accurate results. I think we have a question. Uh, yeah, I was uh, gonna... Can you hang on just a minute, Benny? Sure. I was going to ask a quick question. Uh, how did you choose the plant and how did you like how did you choose um, what approach to take for the experiment? So. Choosing the plant. Um, again, not the most scientific answer. I kind of just went to Home Depot and found, um, two as close to identical houseplants as I could. Um, I made sure they were the same species and everything and same size, roughly. Um, I will say definitely going forward, if that was one of the things that me and Rob had discussed, if we were going to repeat this experiment again, we would try to do it with a plant that was more water sensitive, but the idea was because we wanted this to be in the scope of, at the very least, something that would be low cost, we would want to do it with a plant that people who would be using it for that application would have. So we were looking for something like a house plant or something that was relatively cheap so that it was, we were kind of catering to our audience in a way so that the results of our experiment would apply to someone who could actually use a device that we would develop. Let, okay. let me interject something here before you, you go on. So the the other researchers who have done this um, successfully with trees use invasive embedded sensors. So they drill very large holes in the trees and jam electrodes into the living tissue of the tree. And we were attempting to do something that was perhaps foolishly ambitious. We were attempting to measure the stem impedance without damaging the plant by just wrapping an electrode around the outside of the stem. Now, um, I think I, I wasn't paying attention. Binet chose plants which have a somewhat waxy exterior, which would not be a good choice for measuring impedance through the waxiness of the stem in the first place. Um, and in, in the second place, I think what we've learned is that our electrode design and our electrode attachment uh, thing is actually um, so important that it's possible that, that we're not reading anything except variations in our electrode designs here. Um, so we have learned that. Back over to you, Benny. Yeah, so definitely. And I'm gonna talk more about um, the electrode portion of what Rob was saying in a little bit. But yeah, as a, as for to answer what why we, went with this approach for the experiment. Like I said, it was, it was, we found a very similar experiment in a paper that we had read. And um, for us, it was super promising because it was essentially, they had used the same type of 
I guess, like measurement or the same, they're, they're using electrical impedance spectroscopy to like gauge the health of a plant, which is exactly what we were trying to do. And they were able to do it successfully on this, on this tree that they were using. And so the, the idea was that if we were able to repeat this experiment in a way, um, using, using our own materials, that it would allow us then to, it, it would help us learn a lot about what worked and what didn't and how we could apply this then into a prototype design going forward. Unfortunately, we didn't get there, um, but let, that is how we came to this approach for the experimentation. It's interesting to hear you describe that uh, you chose a cheap plant because a cheap plant would be more approachable, uh, but it's funny to me because I, I would have thought that somebody buying a two hundred dollar VNA, even though that's really cheap for a VNA, uh, is still a pretty decent instrument. Um, I would think they're trying to care for a, a, a very loved and cherished plant uh, if they're <laughs> buying equipment to monitor its health. Definitely a good point. Definitely a good point. I will say, like I said, that is something that, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Looking back, I would have definitely done more research onto what type of plant maybe would be best for this type of experiment. Um, and also to keep in mind, we were also, we had to look for plants that were already grown. You know, it's not like we could exactly grow something out. We, it's not like I could buy, you know, seeds and then grow a plant from scratch because, you know, we were on a bit of a timeline. Um, especially because I wanted to, I was hoping to finish up this project as I started my semester. But yeah, like I said, ultimately, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. That was definitely one of the biggest things that in the future, if I was to continue working on this or pick it up again, or recommend something to someone who does pick this project up, I would definitely say, you know, spend some time researching what plant you're going to use because it's going to make a big difference on your results. Okay, moving on. So as we got to the end of our experiment, obviously our results were pretty inconclusive, which was a little bit disappointing, but at the same time, you know, there's always a silver lining. And I think that silver lining for us was that we had laid a lot of groundwork in an area where we did not have a lot of background knowledge or expertise going in. So that leaves a lot, it essentially left a lot of room for future experimentation. So what we would do next, if we were to repeat the experiment, uh, we would do so with more research into reliable electrodes. And this kind of goes along with what Rob was saying before. One of the main things that we were trying to do with our experiment that set us apart from what other research groups were doing in this area is that we were trying to take these measurements without damaging the tissues of the plant. And because of this, we, like Rob said, perhaps foolishly just assumed we could, you know, take an electrode, apply it towards to the outside of the plant, and it would give us the same kind of results as if we were doing applying electrodes invasively. I don't, I agree with Rob. I don't think that that was the case. And it is possible that our measurements were just even as far as it's, it's possible to say is it go as far to say as all of our measurements were just electrical noise or characteristic of the design of our electrodes. So definitely going forward, if I were to, if we were to repeat this experiment, we would need to take a considerable amount of time to research into manufacturing and creating and designing more reliable electrodes where we could really trust our results. I would say that was probably the biggest issue and one of the biggest things that I would try to change going forward. Uh, some other things that we would do if we were to repeat the experiment is to, like we said before, pick a more water sensitive plant that might give us uh, greater variation in results over a shorter period of time. <clears throat> um, we would probably repeat an experiment over a longer period with more consistency uh, and probably a lot more preparation and planning going in 
just because we we have this experience now and we've taken the time to lay out what works and what doesn't work. We would repeat the experiment over a frequency range with higher frequencies because like we said before, we found that changes were more dramatic in impedance in higher frequencies. So the data is more telling. And because of that, it would probably be more helpful for us to increase our frequency range a bit. We would probably repeat the experiment, if possible, in a more controlled environment. Um, this experiment was done pretty much entirely in my house. So, you know, it, it becomes a little bit difficult to control the lighting, the temperature. Um, a, I mean, it's better than leaving the plant outside, to be fair. But at the same time, it's not like we were in a lab setting where we could control every variable and then just alter the water that we were putting into a plant. So definitely, if we had the resources to do this experiment in a lab setting, that would definitely be nice in the future. And again, overall, just repeating the experiment with more consistency would definitely be helpful. Um, this experiment and this set, this uh, series of experimentation was exploratory more than anything else. Um, it de It was more for us to learn and see, like I said, you know, what's gonna go right, what's gonna go wrong, and work reactively based on that. So because we have this knowledge base now, in the future, if we were to repeat the experiment, we would definitely do so um, more consistently. If we were to set up a new experiment, because there's a lot of more, a lot of room we found in our literary research to test for things other than EIS, or to do or to test for EIS, EIS in a way that differed from how we did it. One thing that we might want to do is compare plant moisture with soil moisture. Um, so compare our impedance measurements in our plant with measurements we're taking from a soil moisture sensor, which are much more commonplace in on the market and on the market um, readily, readily available. And another thing that we might want to test in the future is the S parameters or the capacitance of a plant because a lot of our literary research and a lot of things we found or a lot a lot of the groups that we were researching found success looking at these parameters of a plant and relating them to plant health. Um, I wouldn't say that there was any more or less success compared to impedance sensing, but it definitely would just be nice to explore that area as well. So just as an overall summary, what we learned or didn't learn. So starting with the negatives, like I said, we were unsuccessful in supporting our hypothesis. Our data was largely inconclusive. Um, we discovered that the problem that we were trying to address was much more intricate than we had anticipated. And ultimately our biggest issue we were, was we were very unsure of the reliability of our electrodes. And like I said, although this experiment was objectively at some point, a <clears throat> excuse me, a failure, there were a lot of positives and there was definitely a silver lining. Ultimately, we laid significant groundwork for future experimentation um, and to explore this type of project further. We showcased the usefulness of the nano VNA and we had the opportunity to explore an open problem and kind of find direction and the uh, a host of directions that we could run with in the future and i think that is that is all i have so if anyone has any questions feel free to ask okay thank you very much benny um I'm, i suspect people have some questions uh so um please this would be the time to come off mic and shout them out Sorry, yeah. Uh, I had one more question. Uh, you mentioned that you were trying not to harm the plant with the electrode design. Can you talk some more about the, what the electrode design was, or did you have a host of electrode designs? Or um, sure, what do you mean? Sure, by? sure. I can I can definitely do that. So let me go back here a couple slides just so that we have a um a picture here to go off of. So the electrode design was 
something that we didn't have a lot of basis on from our literary research, because like I said, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the papers that we had read were using invasive methods. So whether that was driving like metal spikes or nails into plants or trees, typically trees, um, or cutting out a piece of uh, wood from a tree trunk to measure, um, those were those were like the most typical methods that we saw for taking these kinds of measurements and collecting this data. So we didn't have a ton to work off of is essentially what I'm getting at. So what we decided to do was we found that electrotechnical um, sheet nickel, which is just a fancy word for nickel that is used uh, to make electrodes, was something that I believe at least one, but possibly more groups had used in their projects successfully as an electrode material. So we decided on that, um, especially because it's relatively cheap material to uh, get access of. And as a, in terms of physical shape and design in that sense, we wanted to maximize the surface area that was covering the, that the electrode met with the stem so to do that, we the sheets we bought were these small little rectangular sheets, and they were uh, bendable. Um, they were pretty thin, so they were pretty easy to shape. So what I did was I wrapped them around in like a helix shape on each side. This way I can maximize the surface area that was in contact with these electrodes from the stem. And all that did was it, it just... Um, it made sure that we were getting the best connection between the plant and the electrode possible because maximizing the surface area means there's more room for electrons to flow and thus current to flow. And did you have any, um, did you do any experiments with um, degrees of invasiveness as far as like scratching the bark, totally removing the bark? Uh, mm. No, we did not, but that is definitely something that as a group we discussed wanting to explore in the future. Um, even just to see if the electrodes were reliable, you know, to measure across the electrodes, see what we get, and then hopefully with a plant that we didn't plan on using in the future, just chop straight through or take a chunk out between those electrodes and see how it had impacted our measurements. Um, that's definitely something that would be super helpful to explore in the future um, because it would uh, give us a lot more context for the problem. So no, the in, in short, no, it's not something that we experimented with, but it is definitely something that we talked about doing in the future. Cool, thanks. Okay. Hi, this is, hi, this is um, Sean um, Cooper from Interstellar. I don't know if you answered this already because I came in a few minutes um, after you started. But um, did you say the age of the, of the plant that you did this study on? I did not. So I couldn't tell you the age, honestly. I, I definitely think they were fairly new plants, though, because I bought them, like, fresh from Home Depot. So... I guess not new in terms of they weren't like, you know, they hadn't just sprouted. They were fully matured adult plants, um, but they were in very healthy condition when I bought them. So in, again, in short, no, I, I, I did not know the age of the plants, but they were definitely pretty much fully matured um, like lily pad plants. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Christina asked uh, what kind of plants they were, and I guess uh, they were lily pads. The Russian Academy of Sciences used agricultural apples that had been grafted, um, but it, we didn't have that available. Uh, if if we had it to do again, we might design that a little more carefully. I have one question. So. 
this is a bell pepper, right? And mm -hmm. it's, I don't know, it's going to be like six months probably. And I've been keeping inside because I'm trying to make him to survive. So actually he can transplant it late the next year. So my first question is, with the equipment that you have, can I test this based on the stem? Or what will be like the best way to actually start with studying the plant? Yeah, itself? sure. So with what we have now and what we use for this experiment, um, just from what I could see from the plant that you showed, we probably would not be able to test on a plant like that just because it's so young, um, the stem is so thin, um, and the ultimately the materials would probably just be too heavy for the plant to support. But okay. the idea was that, you know, as, as an ultimate, like, end goal, that we would be able to have something where we could test on a plant like that or something of similar size and shape. Okay, I have another question. I have, based on what Robert mentioned early, that it's uh, too invasive, the approach that he's been taking with the trees. I guess this will be, when will be like the right time for actually start to analyzing a tree? I'm starting two different trees from seeds. So okay. uh, this is one. So I don't know, maybe you can see like the stem is also like barely weak. Um, mm -hmm. It's one year, I think, so far. And in here I have like three. But I will be like interesting in a study like a tree in instead of like a, a plant, like um, a, a agronomic or um, like a, pepper. a vegetable. Yeah. So does the stem... Do you think it needs to have like certain certain thickness? Probably like, I don't know, two inches. Okay, so again, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I think it kind of just depends on the device that you create. Cause ideally you would be able to test it at any stage of development. Um, but again, what we what we have is an ideal. So I, I think it just like as, as, at the end of the day, it kind of comes down to, you know, can can the plant support like the materials that your device that the device would be made out of? Can it hold it up? I don't think that the size of the plant or the age of the plant would actually limit the data that you're getting in any way. I think it's just a matter of like in terms of hardware, would it be able to support physically and mechanically the hardware that you're using to take those measurements. All right, thank you. Okay, well, if the, there are no more questions, I wanna just point out a, a few things. So as, as Binay said, using electrical impedance measurements on wood, by which we mean timber, that is not living tissue, but dead wood, whether it's um, for archaeological purposes or uh, for some other reason, is pretty well established. But it's done in a very destructive way. You cut a disc of you know a, an exact thickness and you put it in a machine with two plates of an exact thickness and you measure the uh, um, impedance. And in that way, you can get a reliable measure of the moisture content of the wood. But we were trying to measure something more in living plants. And it, it's clear that we, we have to work on our electrode um, design quite a bit. But I still think there's some potential here in the sense that the nano VNA can do very sophisticated measurements for less than $200. We have not shown that we can detect a signal related to plant health from that impedance. But I still suspect this, that it is possible to do that with proper electrode design. And there's some support in the botany research that that should be possible. So 
what what would be the goal here? It would be to design electrodes combined with electrical sensing apparatus that made it cheap and reliable to actually monitor a plant kind of the same way that you would monitor a human patient over a relatively long period of, of time. Okay. Now, one one of the things that you may may never be easy to achieve is the ability to compare different plants because of the problem of making the electrode geometry consistent. Okay, but within one plant, if you could make a ruggedized system over the course of a year and you 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 know you put it on a tree outside, what I was hoping was that you could see clear variations in sunlight and rainfall and temperature and so forth measured in the electrical signal over time within the same plant. Within the same plant, the geometry of the electrodes is, is less important because you would only be looking at a relative measurement. Um, but we we it's going to take a lot more work uh, for us to do that. Um, my experience has been this this may be different, but when I was in graduate school, the biologist didn't know anything about computers and the, the computer scientist didn't know anything about biology. And so I think there's fruitful um, area for research by bringing um, sort of computer nerds like Bene and I to bear on botany if we can just learn enough botany to actually do something useful, which we may not quite have achieved that in in this space of time, but but we learned a lot. Uh, go ahead, Megan. Hey, sorry, I'm just a little under the weather. So if I sound a little mucky, um, please let me know. Um, what I would ask is, or what I kind of, I, I want to propose as an idea would be an exploration of materials because in a way there's a complexity to the design of the electrode that you kind of see with like biomedical stuff, which is more my background than botany, of course. But I'm wondering if an adhesive electrode would be insightful for the next experiment implementation rather than like a metal because that's pretty weighty, right? Like, um, and there's no fear of inertness sensitivity or no fear of like, I mean, obviously I'm a little bit limited in my understanding of why the electrode design is more mechanical based. Um, I don't know if the adhesive would interact too much directly with the surface to like harm the bark or, and I'm not an expert in body or plants of any sort to know if like, maybe it would trap moisture inside the electrode sticky, but I'm just wondering if maybe like a, a fabric electrode would have been, could be insightful for future iterations and what that could look like from your preliminary research, I guess. Bene, do you want to answer that? <laughs> Sorry. Sure. So. It's definitely a really good idea. Uh, it definitely makes a lot of sense. The thing is, we so the reason that we didn't look for something like that, or I guess maybe it didn't cross our minds, is more because we were just working with the very basics. Um, and you know, I'm not I'm not like a material scientist. I'm not a mechanical engineer, and um, I'm not even an electrical engineer yet. I still got like two more. I still got like two more years before I graduate. But a, traditionally, electrodes are made of metal in most applications, so that's why we use them here. But I will say, if there is an adhesive fabric type of electrode that could be applied for this type of application, I could see that definitely being far more advantageous in comparison to using a traditional metal electrode. So it's definitely a really good point. I think Joe has a question. You wanna go ahead, Joe? Yeah, I just, you had mentioned earlier that it's, I think you said it was common or well-known to measure moisture in timber using these methods. And I'm, I'm curious to hear more about that. I, I wasn't aware that that was a common approach. Um, I know that measuring moisture in timber before making furniture out of it is extremely uh, important, but uh, most devices that I've seen that do that measurement are 
very simple and you basically have to force two electrodes that, that are a uh, fixed distance down into the wood as much as possible in order to get an accurate reading. Um, is, can you talk more about uh, what you were referring to when you said it was commonplace? Sure. So the devices that are on the market that you referenced, uh, they use a very similar type of, um, I guess, uh, mechanism to make those measurements. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the difference between electrical resistance versus electrical impedance, but just as a um, brief overview for anyone who isn't, uh, I guess, doesn't have that background. Essentially, there's there's two types of electrical power, uh, direct current and alternating current. Uh, direct current is when electrons flow straight through in one direction, through a wire or through whatever it is that you're putting electrical power through. Alternating current, um, the electrodes are moving back and forth um, in like a sinusoidal motion. So the, they'll correspond to like a sine wave or a cosine wave in their voltage and current. So essentially what resistance is, is it's the relationship between DC voltage and DC current. Um, and impedance is the relationship between AC voltage and AC current. And the, the main, the main, main difference is, is that impedance is dependent on the frequency of the power that you're using, whereas resistance is not dependent on any frequency because direct current doesn't have frequency. It's just a constant value typically. So for the devices that are on the market where you're measuring the moisture content in, in dead wood or timber, just using two prongs, what that is typically using is it's just making a resistance measurement uh, across those two electrodes based on the signal going in and the signal you receive coming out. But a lot of what we saw in the research papers that we were reading in the articles is stuff that's less commonplace maybe in like a in like you would see in like a store or on in like on Amazon or something. But in a research setting using EIS um, or using impedance measurements is typically a lot more helpful because it has this whole frequency domain that you can measure across. So it's giving you typically more information on the actual makeup of the plant and how it's... Um, what what that measurement means basically in relation to moisture content. So it's when I said it was commonplace, I should have explained it's commonplace in the research that's being done in this topic at the moment, probably not commonplace in something that you would see online or in everyday life. If you're looking at something like that, where you're measuring the moisture content of wood, typically it's based on DC resistance. Rob had also mentioned that it was, I, I think he said commonplace also. I don't know if that's the same understanding Rob has. Well, the paper that I read was using this for um, archaeological purposes. I see. So, so they were taking very old wood, like in a Roman building or, or, or something, and attempting to, to analyze it in, in that way. Um, you know, I should point out, um, I, I'm i only moderate on the scale of uh, woo-wooism, right? But, you know, when it comes to plants, my belief going into this was that being able to measure across an entire spectrum of frequencies might show a strong difference in response at different frequencies, which could give you the kind of signal that, that you could ask the question, why is it responding at different different frequencies? We barely saw that. We saw that a little, as you saw in the graphs that, that Benny pointed out. But I was hoping for something much deeper, like a notch at a given frequency, you know, where we could say, this frequency is particularly important to plants. Now, those things may still exist, but until we solve the problem of good electrodes, 
I'm not sure we're going to be able to discover those things. Okay. And the, that's the kind of thing you don't expect to find in a dry piece of timber, whereas you might expect to find it in the living vascular tissue of a plant for whatever reason, because, for example, it has a lot of sugar in it or it, it has a lot of, you know, a higher salt content or, you know, some some other chemical uh, reason. That's just conjecture on my part. You know, but what I was hoping to do here was to build an instrumentation that let us um, start to see inside to the chemistry of plants the same way we have many instruments to see inside the chemistry of a, a mouse in a in a laboratory, for example. But we we only dipped our toe in the water uh, in this experiment. I see uh, Cledon has joined us. Uh, Cledon recently uh, tagged storm petrels in Africa, and caught the birds and put bands on their their legs. Uh, so uh, he was also doing some um, uh, perhaps well motivated science work than um, than what we we've been been doing here. Uh, Cledon, would you like to come off mute and mention what you did? on that island in Africa? I'm not sure you can hear me. Uh, hello. Hi, Clinton. Go ahead. OK, OK. So um, it, it actually happened in um, Nosoy, an, an island that's in the Faroe Islands, um, with some scientists from um, Wales. And um, they, they, they came over to be tracking the storm petrels. And then we got the opportunity to join them. And um, so, so we set up a net um, at where they nest and um, to avoid predators, they, they only come at night. So um, the, the net, um, they, when, when they're flying back into their nest, um, the, the net will just catch the birds and then um, they, the scientists will, will take them out of the net. And then um, usually, um, they, they're usually bringing food back to their 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 um their chicks in the nest. So um, when they're caught by the net, usually they they regurgitate um, what they had. So um, they're taking samples of that um, to know the kind of foods that they eat and to know how that helps in their survival because they're very small birds that weigh about 20, 26 grams. Um, or in their fully adults, but then they're able to leave for like 20 years and over. So it was really interesting. And then um, they, they they put these tags on their on their feet if they don't already have it, and record the numbers. And apparently, um, they they haven't seen some of them who have been flying back um, for 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 longer years. And um, yeah, so it was really interesting. Thank you. You know, um, I, that was professional science. But, you know, what Binet and I were hoping to do here was to sort of open a door to amateur science uh, where you didn't have to travel and you could just, you know, do things on, on a relatively small, inexpensive scale. Um, and, and, you know, I still believe that with additional work, we may be able to achieve that, right? What, what we would oh, like yeah. to do is to produce a instrument and a methodology which uh, uh, allows us to have some visibility. Like, like for example, um, you were looking at the stomach contents of these animals, right? And you, you could tell a lot more from that than, you know, than I can tell by looking at a plant. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, and we have a tendency to think of, you know, animals as being much more complex because they move around a lot. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Plants stay put, but they have an interior complexity, which is primarily chemical. 
or yeah, or maybe yeah. that's wrong maybe it, the truth is plants are very simple and that they don't have complexity similar to animals but but i don't think we really know maybe maybe a professional botanist would have an opinion about this but i i don't know if we have the instruments to look inside a plant to be able to answer that question yet yeah 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 um from, from from the little biology that i did in high school um it turns out like um wait i was fascinated to know how like plants are so complicated because prior to that i i only thought they were just very simple and very boring sometimes but um actually they, there's a lot going on right um, right them, yeah Okay, well, we should probably um, stop this recording um, and uh, fold up here. Um, I appreciate everybody being here. This um, meeting occurs the third Thursday of every month. Um, next month, one of my best friends from college and I are going to talk about um, the situation in modern universities and whether or not um, virtual learning, such as at YouTube, where you're going to see this video, um, is making universities obsolete and how we can improve the university experience in a situation where everyone has uh, open access to uh, a, a very large amount of learning material, even though that doesn't mean it makes it super easy to learn. Um, so uh, that's what we'll be talking about in November. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, especially to Binet for carrying out this research even though I sort of started him off on a bit of a, a goose chase, as it were, uh, I, I think we made something slightly valuable out of it, even if we didn't uh, achieve our goals. Yeah. Uh, I just want to also thank everyone for coming. And also thank you to Rob again for the opportunity. Um, this was awesome. Uh, a really great experience for me, so I appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, thank everybody. It was really enjoyable talk. Yeah.